Hello friends, welcome again to Equip Kingdom. We're back again for another week to dig deep into God's word, to learn who he is, who we are in Christ Jesus and how we live in his kingdom. Welcome back. I, I hope that you're excited about today because we're, we're digging even deeper into the Sermon on the Mount, as you know. Um, you know what I wanna do? I always want the Holy Spirit to guide us in our time together and I need this today. So I'm just gonna let the Holy Spirit take over let's welcome him in oh yes god this is just not going to happen without you today it's it's you who guides us into new revelation it's you who guides us into new light so i just ask and pray that you you show us yourself that you reveal who you are that that you take what seemed harsh and and hard and rules and laws and and you you show us what your heart is in all of this uh, we, we pray always that this honors you and that it glorifies you and we give you our time as, as worship and we praise you and we lift you up and we glorify you in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So last time, as you may remember, uh, and that was really, really long, so I apologize for that. They're not usually going to be that long, but... I couldn't stop talking about the Beatitudes. So, but last time, as you remember, Jesus was introducing uh, identity into us, uh, sharing who we are as citizens of the kingdom. And um, because that is something that is central to who he is as our king and, and really does define him, um, it's important that we spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, it's kind of hard to think about how we're blessed when we're acting in a way that that brings persecution in a way that makes us come to the end of ourselves and and uh, has our has God defending us when we can't necessarily see him hear him um, but we know that he's there and so we it's really a good um, introduction <laughs> into how to die to self and and how to trust God when when we don't have any control in how all of this happens and so Jesus is introducing this to us um, and we're gonna pick up with uh, some laws that were well known to everyone a number of these come from the Ten Commandments uh, in Exodus 20 so uh, and Jesus is gonna reveal them to us in a way that we just haven't seen yet and and it's a way that that shows us the heart behind all this and and in so doing uh, calls us to to not only follow them with our hands and with our mouths and with our eyes and ears but also with our hearts and this is this is one of those times I think when Jesus is teaching that I can imagine that the disciples who were there with him although they were no doubt in awe of him um, there was a lot of self-reflection going on and and hopefully a little self-awareness but the idea that things that they had believed about what it meant to follow God and what it meant to be chosen of God. Um, he's going to, Jesus is going to turn that right on its head for us. So let's go ahead and pick up right away with Jesus making a pretty bold announcement in uh, verse 17. So we're in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, this is one of four times when Jesus says, I have come to do, or I have not come to do. In, in Matthew alone, he also says it in, in some of the other Gospels. Uh, when he says something like this, this is, this is to draw your attention, and it's to uh, take something that could very easily be misunderstood, but is central to who he is, and, and what it means to, to be a part of his kingdom. And so uh, he's, he's telling you, to pay attention and to get ready to dismiss something that you may have believed. So let's start with, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. This is how the Jewish leaders uh, talked about the Torah or the, or the Old Testament. They called it the law and the prophets. Um, Matthew in particular is, is showing us throughout his gospel how Jesus accomplishes what the prophets foresaw and in so doing Jesus is demonstrating the righteousness that the law required this is a, a central part to uh, Matthew's message in his gospel that that it's 
it's considered the bridge between the old and the new and showing the fulfillment of the old so that coming into the new, you, you know where you stand. But you know what, Jesus is also speaking in, in future terminology here, um, at least as far as we're concerned, because God is outside of time, of course. He, he gives us time so that we, we know that we have to rest, our bodies have to. Um, and at first glance, what he's about to say in, in 5.18 seems eschatolo eschatological, which is a very fancy $50 word for saying end times. Um, that he's prophesying this. So let's go ahead and look at 518 and I'm going to suggest to you some very interesting uh, angles at which we can look at what he's saying. 518 says, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So we know that Jesus is coming to fulfill the requirements of the law. He just said that. Um, so it's one of these things that can be a little confusing. So if Jesus is coming to fulfill the law, uh, why then is there still some law in place until heaven and earth pass? So are we thinking, is there going to be some sort of end time when finally we don't have to follow the law? Um, I think most scholars take the what I would call the conservative perspective that Jesus is indeed referring to end times. And um, in this case, and also in another case, he, he says almost the same wording in Matthew 24, verse 35. He's, he's talking to his disciples at this point and pretty much preparing them for his departure and even what's going to come much later. Let's go ahead and look at 2435 because there's one twist into what he says here. So remember, he's just said that um, that until heaven and earth disappear, that uh, not one letter or actually a tittle or a yod in, in the Hebrew version of it would disappear until um, everything is accomplished. And then 1235 or 2435, excuse me, says heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So there's that twist in that, right? Both in both cases, a lot of scholars believe that he's talking about end times, future, um, Jesus' second coming, his millennial kingdom, which <clears throat> we'll dive deeper into in the new later in the New Testament, in the, the epistles to that Paul writes to the different churches, in particular Thessalonians and or Thessalonica would be the name of the church. And then also, of course, in Revelation, where it actually happens, right? Um the notable difference between the two, of course, is that Jesus is saying here that um, that the law will eventually pass away. And here he's saying my words will never pass away. So that's something that I actually want you to keep in, in the back of your mind. Now, there's a smaller group of, of scholars. So most scholars, as you say, they believe that, that Jesus is talking about end times, that when the end comes, when the old earth and the old Jerusalem and all the revelation takes place and the new Jerusalem comes down to earth, um, when the old heaven and earth pass away, the new Jerusalem comes, um, that's when we won't have any law, but we'll still have Jesus's words. That's what most believe. There's a smaller group of scholars who suggest that Jesus is not actually referring to end times when he says both of these, but instead to the fall of the second temple, in, uh, which happens in AD 70. So, so the Romans, uh, basically, they come in to, to put down an uprising uh, that the zealots, the nationalists have built up. This is after uh, Jesus has passed, uh, some what, 30 odd, 35 odd years have passed. And the Romans come in and they, they put it down and oh my goodness, it, Jerusalem is decimated and and the temple is destroyed and there are prophecies that Jesus is going to speak in that same chapter in chapter 24 that deals specifically with the fall of the second temple and what these smaller group of scholars say is that it's also happening where he's talking about this here in in uh, chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount he's already talking about the end of the the second temple in Jerusalem 
And this theory kind of plays with the idea that heaven and earth, that when heaven and earth is mentioned, because there has been some uh, metaphorical use of, of heaven and earth referring to the temple and, and to Jerusalem at the large. So uh, it, it, the, the original temple, the temple that Solomon built, and, and to some extent the replicated second temple, it, it had a lot of depictions of, of earthly elements, uh, earth, wind, earth, air, fire, and water. And of course, heaven is, is in the Holy of Holies, where God himself is present. Um, the rest of the space represents earth and the courts around represented the sea. It's an interesting theory. Um, because Jesus describes and talks about in Matthew 24, both the end times and the fall of the second temple, there's, there's probably some context for thinking that Jesus is not talking about an end times thing here, but, but, and how we look at all end times scripture, but instead talking about a more immediate, um, destruction of, of really what tied the law to, to a lot of the, uh, rituals of the people, right? Because once, once the temple's destroyed, there are no more sacrifices. Those can't be had because the sacrifices were only done in the temple. The law itself also, it's kind of hard to go to the festivals when there's no place to go. So it becomes just a different way of expressing worship. So there's, there's context there for that. But I'd like to suggest to you that there's something else that may play off that idea a little differently. What Jesus is talking about here when he says heaven and earth uh, will pass away uh, before, and I'm going to go back to that scripture right here, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not, not any part of the law will disappear until everything is accomplished. Okay, so here's my idea. I want to suggest to you, I want to make the suggestion, that when Jesus is talking about heaven and earth disappearing, he's talking about himself me out I know this is different but who better represents the union between heaven and earth than Jesus right um, God made flesh uh, the kingdom of heaven come down among us Emmanuel God with us heaven and earth together um, you could easily see how the tabernacle that, that Moses was commanded to make at God's direction, that the elements, the components of the tabernacle represent Jesus from the sacrifice to the fellowship to the Shekinah presence of God himself in the Holy of Holies. All of these things collectively represent Jesus. Yes. Um, and then Jesus himself in, in John 2, 19, he, uh, this is during his first trip to Jerusalem, which has already happened by the time we have this, this conversation, the Sermon of the Mount. Um, Jesus refers to himself as the temple that will be raised in three days after the people destroy him. You may remember that. If you haven't read it yet, we're going to read it and you'll know it then. And, you know, this actually fits better with the notion that every tittle and yod of the law will disappear before everything is accomplished. When will that be? When will everything be accomplished? Well, it's already happened, at least in our time. It's already happened. This is not an end times prophecy. Let's go to John 1930. This is this is really the end of Jesus's earthly life. Um, he's on the cross and he's about to breathe his last. And it says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Heaven and earth pass away. Jesus crucifixion. If, if you're Christian and you've been walking for at least a while, little while, when Jesus says it is finished, it has been, everything has been accomplished. Um, our sin, our shame, our death, our um, slavery to sin and death, those have ended. It is finished. 
the power is gone. It has been taken away from the enemy. Um, with that happening, it his death, the, the end of the old, it ushers in the new covenant uh, in which Holy Spirit indwells within us. And as Jesus's heirs, which we are all, um, he makes us the new place of heaven where heaven and earth come together. And that may be uh, where it's this at hand and not yet that he also speaks of throughout. And again, what ends with Jesus's fulfillment is it's not the kingdom rules, right? I've been in plenty of discussions where I've heard that, that Christians say Jesus died at the cross. We don't have to follow the law. I've heard it. We're no longer um, accountable to the law. And I tell you that the Sermon on the Mount completely disputes that. As a matter of fact, I think we're held to an even higher standard. I, I may have already mentioned this, um, but I'm going to mention it again. Um, we're being held to a higher standard. We're being held to a heart standard. Because the rules that God put into place, when God spoke them, he spoke them with an intent in mind. His heart was behind these. Um, and as we just read in Matthew 24, 35, his words, Jesus's words, God's words will never pass away. No yodes or tittles are, are, are involved here. We're talking about God's heart, his intention behind what he set in place. So as we begin to look at these different commandments, which are really going to make the, the bulk of our conversation today, we will see that keeping the law in its strictest or most narrow interpretation or application, it never made us righteous. Um, there are Jewish people who would disagree with me with that, but as kingdom citizens, we, as followers of Jesus, as as the ones who know the way to the Father is through him, through Jesus, we're called to the highest standard of the law. And this is in our heart posture, right? And Jesus is gonna make this super plain in uh, verses 19 and 20. Let's go ahead and take a look at those. And they say, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus talks about the least of these commands, he's making a commentary on the Jewish sages who took quite a bit of time and effort to rank God's commands from least to greatest. Um, most rabbinical scholars considered Exodus 20, 12, uh, which is honoring your parents so that you may live, uh, the, to be the greatest commandment. One, because it offered a promise, the promise of long life if you did these things. And, and so people are always excited when they know they're getting something in exchange for whatever sacrifices they have to make by honoring their parents. The least commandment, according to these sages, was in Deuteronomy 22, 7, which is if you see a bird's nest that's fallen from a tree, you're allowed to take the young, but you have to leave the mother behind. That's one of God's commands. Now, Jesus, as I mentioned last week and well, just about every week, uh, he tells us the greatest commandments, right? To, to love and honor God with everything you have and to love others as you love yourself, right? This is about loving this is this is the heart posture right um these are the ones who are going to give you the heart for following everything else and it's it's central to everything that jesus talks about and and i can't think of a single time that jesus has uh, a conversation about one of his teachings one of his deeply held uh non-negotiables in the kingdom and it doesn't center around or or at least start with the idea that it, that you have to love in order to be able to to do this. Now, rabbis recognize that occasionally everyone sins and and they break God's laws. They they really speak to the humanity side of it, right? They they recognize our frailties and they're a little forgiving for that. 
And so what they would do is they would distinguish between weightier laws, weightier laws, and those which could be overlooked if broken, you know, like if you accidentally do this or or you you do it, you did it, but you didn't really mean anything by it. Um, now we're going to go much deeper into this very mentality in chapter 23. And, and by this time, Jesus is, he's pretty much straight shooting with the Pharisees by the time we get to chapter 23, after having several, um, interactions with them where they're outright blasphemous. And, and he, I think he's just, he shows grace and, and character and just how he handles them. But here's something that I want you to pick up on, right? God does not differentiate on, on how he rewards commandments. So if you don't murder anyone, you get this level of reward. But if you, if you take the mom along with the birds, <laughs> you get different. No, he's not about that. He is saying, Jesus is saying in this very um, beginning of his discourse on this part of the law that... God's going to reward you the same for, for holding the least of these and teaching the least of his commands as he would the great and, and not following his command, the least of his commands. It has the same punishment as the greatest. And all of these, by the way, are, are, are sin, right? If you don't follow his commands, it's sin. We talked about this last time, sins of omission and sins of commission. And, and what they mean and and if you haven't watched that yes it's a long video and but I hope there's a lot of meaty stuff maybe you can break it into chunks if it's too long let me go on so Jesus says you have to be more righteous than the Pharisees what's he talking about here um, I think first of all he's talking about what they taught right they were they were very strict in, in what they taught. And, and I think I mentioned this in chapter two, that they had become incredibly observant of the law after the return from the Babylonian and Persian, well, Assyrian, Babylonian and Persian exile, right? They, they understood, or at least they believed that because the people had strayed so far from God that they were really worshiping other deities and and dishonoring God in the process that they made it a point to create these what were called fences around the law so that people would be very careful and it would be harder to break the law especially laws that concerned God himself now you and I know Every law concerns God himself. Every heart posture concerns God himself. He's very concerned with what's going on in, in our hearts and what we're thinking. And and so he, he gives us a lot of tools, especially when we get to uh, Paul's epistles. We, we have a lot of tools as to how to, to deal with thoughts that are um, going astray or a heart posture that's not in the right place. So let me get back to this. So the Pharisees blamed the destruction of Jerusalem and the first temple, Solomon's temple, on this uh, apostasy, on this idolatry that the people had. So they were very zealous to keep the law. Now, I told you just a moment ago that they, they put together these action-oriented fences around the law to make sure that people didn't accidentally break it. Now, here's an example of that, right? So in Exodus 23, 19, God commands the people not to boil a baby goat in, in its mother's milk. So to put a fence around that law, rabbis decreed that milk and meat have to be eaten separately, even if we're talking about different animals that they would come from, which is why you, if you're friends with any observant Orthodox or 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 uh, deeply religious Jews. They may even have separate kitchens, separate refrigerators for keeping milk and meat, right? And this, ha this is that fence around the law that the Pharisees built to protect people from accidentally breaking the law. But Jesus is telling, that, telling us that without him, we need to be even more observant than the Pharisees were, right? I think this actually means two things. First, that 
the Pharisees definition of, of righteousness, uh, the definition and the practice of righteousness, it wasn't enough. Um, to follow the rules of the old covenant meant being in complete ob obedience, which is impossible by God's standards. Um, we're later going to be introduced to a conversation between Jesus and a rich young ruler who, who claims that he's never broken a commandment. That's true as far as the Pharisees guidelines would be concerned, but it wouldn't have been true from God's perspective because we already know that he has uh, idolatry over money and wealth. We'll get around to that. The other is the me uh, the other meaning in my opinion is an invitation. When he says that you have to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, I think he's inviting us to think differently. And I think this is going to be very much supported in how he next speaks of these laws. The kingdom invitation is to be made righteous in Jesus. Not following the law, not being responsible for your own righteousness. It's really hard and if you mess up, you can you can make all of these different accommodations uh, with man, <laughs> but God knows and, and God's our judge. So it really doesn't matter if the Pharisee excused you from it. It really doesn't matter if you're absolved from it from a, a, a human perspective. God's the one who's going to ultimately judge you. So Jesus is saying, you know what? I'm going to offer you an even greater righteousness than the Pharisees have. And it's going to be through me. And that, to me, is an invitation. I mean, because of his gift of Holy Spirit, we're transformed. We don't transform ourselves. He transforms us. Holy Spirit is, is continually in the process of transforming us to make us more like Jesus. Impossible without him. Impossible. Not even on our best days. Now look at how Jesus is going to describe the heart posture behind each of these laws and consider the heart posture that Jesus is putting, the, the fence that Jesus is putting around the law in so doing. And he's almost constructing his own version of the fence. Whereas the fence that was put in place by the Pharisees would legally keep us from, or, or, um, in practice keep us from doing it because because there were legal and and even religious implications for not doing so the fence that jesus is putting around the law when he begins to speak of the heart posture behind these laws it's changing us from preventing us from doing it to us not wanting to do it let's dig in because this is exciting we're going to start off with murder so uh, let's pick up in uh, verses 21 to 26, and Jesus is going to talk to us about what murder actually is. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell therefore if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you leave your gift there in front of the altar first go and be reconciled to them then come and offer your gift settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown in prison into prison truly i tell you you will not get out until you have paid the last penny so murder and the heart implication behind it jesus is starting with uh, exodus 20 13. Now, Exodus 20, as I've already said, this is where the Ten Commandments are located. Um, now, something that struck me as I was I was doing some research into Exodus 20 and, and reading more into it and looking for revelation and something that God said, it struck me uh, about what happens right before God tells Moses to give the people the, the Ten Commandments. 
I want to go to Exodus 19, verse 24. The Lord replied, Go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. God is insisting that the priest and the people are not allowed to come up to God, or he'll break out or punish them. Okay, Right before he gives them these laws, he's telling everyone to stay away or he'll punish them. And what's more, right before this, so it, it says that they, they just picked up from Rephidim, um, which I told you last time, well, in chapter 4, that Rephidim is the place of rest. And we had discussed this during Jesus' testing in the wilderness. And this reminded me of Isaiah's pronouncement on the people and their relationship with the law. So now I want to take you to Isaiah 28, verses 11 to 13. Check this out. Very well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the resting place, let the weary rest, and this is the place of repose. But they would not listen. So then, the word of the Lord to them will become, Do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there, so that as they go, they will fall backward. They will be injured and snared and captured. Through Moses, so so the, the, the foreign tongue and the strange speech, that's Moses. Moses with his stammering lips. I think uh, in one other translation, it picks up the stammering of Moses. God offers rest. They're at Rephidim when they're receiving all of this and they have none of it. The people take his commands and they say, we're going to make these into rules and we're going to make these into uh, traditions and more rules and rituals. And and God is saying here through Isaiah that it, it's actually going to bring their downfall. During Isaiah's time, it's it's right before Assyria is going to come and, and, and really blast the northern kingdom. And then the southern kingdom falls fairly soon after that. This is what I want you to take from it. When the law is originally given, they're in a place of rest. But God says, don't come up to me. You have to stay away from me. Right? The people take the law and they make it into a series of rules and rules and regulations and more regulations and and commentaries on the regulations and traditions on the commentaries and and rituals on the commentaries and the traditions and the and the regulations and the rules. Oh my gosh, this was never intended. It wasn't the heart posture behind any of this. And God was telling them this in Isaiah. He gave it to them during Exodus. He gave it to them through Moses. And their heart posture was so wrong that God reminds them right before they're all about to go into exile. Yes, you, you've turned away from me when I told you. I don't even know how many times. I, if anyone's ever counted how many times God says, don't drift away from me or all these things will be taken from you, let me know because I haven't counted that. It brought their downfall. Now, what I want you to do now is contrast this. So so God gave them the law and his, he, his heart behind it was never really... It, they didn't catch it. And so... They make it into a bunch of that you can't do and you can't do. And here's a fence around what you can't do so that you won't do. And what I want to do now is contrast this with what's happening now with Jesus. The people, first of all, we've already talked about this. They've come to him and he's welcomed them. He offers again rest just as just as God did the first time. He's offering rest to them. He's offering freedom to them. The same freedom that, that God offered them the first time. Remember, they were slaves who had been exited out of four centuries of slavery. Your mindsets, your behaviors, your beliefs, they don't turn overnight. So God's trying to show them a new way. And he was trying to free them from sin then. And uh, he, he, Jesus, is trying to free us from sin now. 
What I want to talk to you now is Romans 8, 1 through 4. <laughs> Get these verses in your spirit, friends. These are good. Let's go to them. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You know, there are, there are times when I just, I just read Romans 8, like, over and over again. It is, it is such a promise of freedom to us. And, and really what Jesus is, is really starting to unwrap right now in, in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5. This is, this is what Paul says that Holy Spirit ultimately gives us in Romans 8. Okay, let's go back to murder. So you haven't killed anyone. I round of applause. Um, good for you. But have you gotten angry with anyone? Um, have you wished that someone got what was coming to them? Have you called them Raka? Which, by the way, you probably you probably haven't called anyone Raka. Sort of a obscure term now, but back in the day, it was a really big insult. And what it translates to basically is good for nothing or empty. Um. Have you called them out because maybe they didn't meet your needs or your expectations or what you thought they should do? Have you called someone a fool because you disagree with them? Well, guess what? You've just murdered someone in your heart by Jesus's definition of what it actually means. Jesus tells us not to go through the motions of honoring God through offerings, through the gifts that he was talking about while you've murdered someone in your heart. The prophet Micah makes this clear that what honors God. So we're going to go to a pretty well-known uh, scripture verse, Micah 6, 8, which says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, I think we could pretty much be in agreement that, that there's nothing just or merciful or humble in murdering someone, um, right? I think we can agree on that. Now, Jesus advises us not to let matters elevate. He's actually prescribing that we be peacemakers in this case. If we choose not to, then judgment and costly imprisonment await, right? That's what he was talking about, where, where if you don't settle this in humility and mercy and justly, then the courts will decide for you and it can get really harsh for you really fast. And you know, I actually think he means something deeper than that because we know who our ultimate judge is. And if we have murder in our hearts, we can't have God there because there's no room for both. So what God says can ultimately happen here is, is that we pay a cost even higher than uh, prison here on earth which by the way at that time would have been really harsh the cost could be eternal and impossible to pay the good news though is that if we repent all of this debt can be paid because he has already finished paying that cost for us this is good news i love talking about the good news right don't you of course because you're here Okay, let's move away from murder and let's go into adultery um, and its consequences. We're now going to read in Matthew 27 or 5 verses 27 to 30. And it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. 
Jesus in this case is referencing again Exodus 20 but now we're in verse 14 the one that comes right after murder another one of the Ten Commandments first of all notice that this tends to be oriented towards men um, that they should not lust after women which he says is no different than actually committing sexual adultery with them Gentiles during this time thought that lust was completely normal it was just a normal part of the life and even rabbis were known to say that a little lust is healthy women during this time were they were believed to to know and and practice magics or that their presence was such that that they had a, a magical or a, a bewitching aura about them that caused men to lust after them in the ancient world women's hair was considered a sexual organ i'm sorry i shouldn't laugh but it's kind of funny um just like what same definition of we would call sexual organs um and as such it had to be covered conservative families in judea and galilee in particular would would have the women in their households cover their hair before they ventured outdoors so that they wouldn't accidentally or inadvertently cause men to lust after them with their great power so next jesus uses some pretty strong hyperbole hyperbole by the way is just a shocking exaggeration um, and he, he does it to make the point that you have to remove the desire that's in the fleshy desire within you not necessarily your flesh but but the flesh part of you uh, the desire to sin through repentance I mean repentance right is turning away from sin turning towards God and becoming righteous in your heart through Jesus Jesus is the way the truth the truth the truth no the truth yes and the life right he he is our way to 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 not give into not only to not give into our desires but because of his holy spirit indwelling within us to transform our hearts so that we don't even want to right impossible without god everything's possible through god he's not advocating that you mutilate yourself i i feel very strongly about this i there are movements throughout Christian history where some people in dedication to God did some pretty extreme things. But Jesus himself is not advocating for this. Um, fundamentally, what he's saying is change your heart or allow your heart to be changed by receiving the kingdom so that you won't want to do it. And at the, the fundamental, what the, the basis of all of this is, is really coveting, right? And he's, he's basically saying, don't covet someone that God has not given to you in, in unity. Jesus is telling us not to want what God does not want for you. That's what he's saying with adultery. Let's now turn to the topic of divorce. We're going to read in verses 31 and 32. And they say, It has been said, Anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. In this case, Jesus is referencing Deuteronomy 24 verse 1. Their certificate of, a, of divorce was known in that time as a git, G-I-T. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in chapter one, where I said that Joseph, uh, Jesus's adoptive father, would have been considered legally, um, it would have been acceptable for him to uh, file for a, a get for Mary, his pregnant bride. Um, but he didn't, and we're grateful for that. Notice once again that this is directed towards men, just like adultery was. Why? Because only men were eligible to get a get. Get a get. <laughs> get your get. Women had no recourse to this at all. Women could not, if a man was, was adulterous, she had to 
be meek and grin and bear it. Jesus is telling men not to break up their marriages. I don't think he's making the point that marriages cannot be broken because that would have been impractical and impractical in our time too. Just that they should not be broken, I think is his point. You know, Paul later is going to build upon this very premise and he's going to say not only sexual immorality, but but abandonment, not only divorce, but abandonment. If you are abandoned in your marriage, uh, that you're being, you're free from it. Because uh, fundamentally what a get gave you was the capacity to remarry again. Uh, Jesus and Paul in, in, are both concerned in this case about the victim, the innocent one who's victimized by a divorce or an abandonment. There were actually two schools of thought in Judaism at this time with regard to divorce. Most matters, actually, there were two schools of thought. The school of the Shemites, Shemaites, excuse me, and the school of Hillel. Uh, the followers of Shemai believed that men could divorce women only if the woman was unfaithful or attempted to be unfaithful. By the way, <laughs> this included going out with naked hair right going out with their hair uncovered um that would have been the equivalent of her exposing herself the hillelites on the other hand they believed that men could divorce their wives for any reason at all um one of the commentaries of of one of the rabbis who followed hillel's teachings said that women could be divorced if they burnt the toast could you imagine a divorce lawyer today going after someone because the wife burnt the toast different time so so get out of your western mindset that that's ridiculous and understand the eastern mind here the near eastern mind the ancient mind here women who were able in both cases women who were unable to conceive they were uh they could be divorced as well because uh the inability to conceive or not conceiving children in a marriage was equivalent in the rabbi's eyes to murder that effectively you murdered uh your future generations your legacy if you weren't able to produce more children both schools just so you know that this isn't so hard-hearted both schools recognize that any divorce for any reason was was sad to God it was it hurt his heart to see it happen because what God brings together no man should should break right that's that's in Genesis Jesus in this case he, he's really an advocate for women here um, with the exception of women who knowingly intentionally purposely commit adultery I'm not talking about rape I'm talking about adultery here they they know what they're doing and they they understand that they're going against their marriage vows. Jesus is calling the men out for victimizing the wives. And he, and actually when a man divorces a woman for reasons other than adultery or, or sexual immorality, I'm just going to put it. Um, he victimizes her first by, uh, putting her in a difficult financial position because they're, there was no, the woman gets the house and the man gets everything else. The man got everything, including the bride price. If the woman remarried, if she was able to find a man who would marry her after she had been divorced, uh, and it hadn't been for an occasion of adultery, then that puts her in a position where she is committing adultery because she's with a man different than the one that God uh, appointed to her or ordained for her. So let's move on from divorce and now move into Jesus's next topic of conversation, which is swearing unnecessary or false oaths. Let's pick up in verse 33 and we're going to go through verse 37. And it say, they say, again, you have heard it that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. 
and do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Jesus here is referencing two different scriptures. First, in uh, not to swear false oaths in Deuteronomy 23, 23, and to not take God's name in vain. Another one of the Ten Commandments that we find in Exodus 20, verse 7. Jesus teaches us that oaths are not the same as having integrity. It's one thing to swear by something. It's another thing to actually do it. And just because you swear by it doesn't necessarily make it true. Whatever your promise is, he's telling you just do it. Um, make it happen to the extent that you're capable. It's If you become incapable, that's okay. Empty promises to him are the exact same thing as lies. If it's a testimony of truth, um, it's not good to connect the truthfulness of your statement to what is God's, what belongs to him. And Jesus is saying, everything's his. Heaven, earth, Jerusalem, it's all his. In doing that, it, it dishonors God. It, it, it's using God's name poorly, taking his name in vain. Um, it also, I think, overstates your capacity and your control, since as he points out, you can't even stop your hair from turning gray. Now, some of us know that we can temporarily do that, but, but I can't tell this hair not to turn gray. It's not in even my capacity to do so. Certainly, it's not in my capacity to swear by something that is beyond my control. Jesus is saying that if you swear upon anything that belongs to God, and everything does, as, we, as he just said, that ultimately you're calling on God to bear witness to what you're saying, right? When you swear an oath on Jerusalem or you swear an oath on, on your children's health or something stupid like that, you're actually calling on God to witness and judge what you're saying. I don't think I want God to, in, to, to bear witness to things that I know in my heart aren't true to say. So, so Jesus says the remedy to this is to just say yes or no and do it or, or just tell the truth. Now, rabbis during this time, they were extremely conscious of using God's name. Um, it wasn't something that they, they did readily. Um, as a matter of fact, they rarely referred to God by one of God's names. They referred to him as Hashem or the name. Shem is name. Ha, the name. Or they might call him Adonai, which means Lord. They, they really were reluctant to speak, to call him by what we call the Tetragrammaton, which is uh, the four uh, letters that comprise the holy name of God. Uh, in our English, it would be Y-H-W-H. Uh, I think in, the, in Hebrew, it would be V-H instead of W. We call, we, we take that name and we, we, we take the Tetragrammaton and we, we bring from it the name Yahweh, which I love saying Yahweh. I, I love calling out to Yahweh. Jehovah is the even more anglicized version of that. As a consequence for not wanting to invoke God directly, they would create these, sur these surrogate objects or they would designate surrogate objects surrogate objects for uh, what people could swear upon. For instance, they would swear upon their right hand, um, which they saw as a relatively harmless thing if the oath were broken. I swear upon my right hand. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Does that sound familiar to you? Getting a little bit of history trivia where these things might have come from? Jewish leaders, of course, were called to adjudicate if an oath had been broken, whether or not it was a violation of breaking a false oath or breaking an oath, which we first brought up in Deuteronomy 23.23, right? So if I make an oath, if I swear by something and, and I break it, I would then have to go before uh, a Pharisee or the Sanhedrin and they would determine whether it was serious and weighty enough to have a, a punishment brought onto it. Just let your yes be yes. Just let your no be no. Anything more than that is, 
is causing trouble that doesn't even have to be there. But even Jesus's half-brother, James, who I've already told you numerous times, his name is Jacob, but in James 5.12, because we're all speaking English here, uh, James makes that very statement. Let your yes be your yes, let your no be your no, or you're just inviting evil to come out. The devil's going to have a foothold all over you, and it's just not necessary. So that's oaths. Jesus is next going to turn to what I think is the very heart of what it needs to, what it means to be meek um, as he reflects on justice in verses 38 through 42. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So this idea of uh, retributive or retaliatory law, that actually is, show, it actually comes up several times in, in the Old Testament. Um, the first time we see it is in Exodus 21, 24. We find it in Leviticus, the, the book of the, the laws of the priests in 2420, and in Deuteronomy 19, verse 21. And when we compare the law that God gave Moses to the laws of other uh, ancient Near Eastern uh, societies at that time, we're going to see that God's law, although this seems really harsh, it's actually much fairer, um, even, in, even to our Western modern perspective. So let me tell you a little bit about the Roman law here. So the, the law of retaliation or reciprocal justice in the Roman Empire was called the Lex Talionis. That's it, Lex Talionis. The Romans view of justice in this case, the law of retribution, an eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Uh, we also know this, of course, from Hammurabi's code of laws. It only applied in Roman times, so throughout the Roman Empire, if you were on equal social status with the person who had harmed you. If someone of higher social strata offended you, attacked you, harmed you in some way, sorry, tough luck, you had no recourse. For God and his law, what he's saying is that everyone, no matter what, where you are on the societal ladder, everyone is to be shown this same treatment. So if you're the governor of Jerusalem and you harm a young child, you're going to be liable to this level of, of justice, right? This equality of justice. And that's the heart behind all of this. Again, God in Exodus, or even throughout Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, he's talking to former slaves who had no rights. And he's trying to teach them not that, that once those who are put in positions of power, that they can exert the same kind of authority that the Egyptians would have exerted over them as slaves. No, no. The, those who have leadership authority over those who do not, they're still treated equally in God's eyes. That's the heart behind all of this. Jesus is going to take this a step forward, a step farther and forward, forward and farther, um, and teach us to look at it differently. How about avoiding retaliation altogether? Right? Now he says, don't resist evil. Turn the other cheek. Is he telling us to let evil have their way, that they get away with violence, they get away with malice? Not necessarily, at least not entirely. In ancient Jewish society, remember, this is who he's talking to. He's talking to Jews. He's talking to Jews in their, in their element, in their society, in their culture. And in their culture, uh, striking someone with the back of your, uh, striking someone with the back of their hand, um, that was considered a severe insult. And if they were held accountable to that, 
there was a severe fine that had to be paid. Um, it was it was punishable. Slapping someone's cheek with the back of their hand, um, it it's not equated with punching someone and dislocating their jaw. It, it's an insult rather than an injury. And what Jesus is saying here, let God take care of that. God is your defender. God will make your vindication shine like the new day sun. Let him handle it. Your feelings are hurt. You're off put. You're offended. You're insulted. Welcome to being a member of the kingdom. Remember, he just talked about that earlier. To me, this is the very definition of meekness that we just talked about last week. Um, not making your rights, not making your privileges, what's due to you, not forcing that upon someone else, but allowing God to take care of it, submitting to him. That's meekness. This is what Jesus is asking us to do. Don't let evil, he, he just, there's no point where he really allows evil to get away with it <laughs> during his time with us on earth. Um, by the time Matthew is actually presenting this teaching, we just talked about this before, Jesus had already dumped the tables of the money changers uh, at the temple in Jerusalem. He had already cast out countless demons. We just read about that in chapter 4. Um, and he he overcomes and and stands up to the devil in his temptation after being uh, made meek for 40 days. Yes, Jesus resists evil and he shows us how to do it. What he's talking about here is that we need to resist the temptation to repay evil with evil, to repay insult with punishment or insult or offense, right? Someone speaks poorly of you, you defend yourself. You, and all you're doing is feeding that. All you're doing is feeding their evil. Instead, Jesus says, turn in the other cheek. Don't worry about it. I got you on this. I mean, we're going to read of Jesus's amazing grace towards the Pharisees and Sadducees who keep kind of pressing his buttons. They, they, he performs these miracles that, by the way, only the Messiah can perform. Can't wait to talk about that. And how do they respond? They say that he's in league with the devil, with Satan himself. Blasphemy! Blasphemy! How does Jesus handle it? He doesn't lose his cool. He doesn't go off and insult them. He speaks truth. He's God, so he can do that. He can handle it. This is what he's teaching to us here. He's teaching us there's a, a way to respond, there's a time to respond, and there's a way to do it that you come out um, pure, you come out of it clean, your hands are clean, and they ultimately will be held responsible for what they have said, what they have done, the evil that they've fomented. They're accountable to it. Whether that happens in your lifetime or not is, is not necessarily your responsibility. Yeah, it's kind of good to see it happen, right? But it's not. Um, what's better to see it happen is is to allow God to work on their heart and and they repent and they become a changed person. And that insult, it's wiped clean for them as well as it's already been wiped clean for you. Next, Jesus is going to speak to active meekness. It's a term I'm making up, but I think it's really appropriate. Think about that. Meekness, by definition, is, is being somewhat passive to defending yourself. And now he's going to tell you to be active in your meekness. Like that? Um, under Mosaic Law, a debtor was forbidden from uh, taking someone's cloak in an effort to settle the debt. And we're going to see this in Exodus 22, 26. And it also shows up in Deuteronomy 24, 13. So Jesus here in saying that, hey... If they come for your tunic, give them their clo your cloak as well. He's saying, even though the law says that you may keep your cloak when they ask you for your inner garment, your tunic, um, go ahead and give it to them anyway. Give them the cloak anyway. That God's mercy and grace are higher 
They're greater than the law. You shouldn't have to rely upon the law to protect you. You shouldn't have to rely upon the law to, to bring you justice. God's ways are higher and greater than that. And so he says, you know what? Give them more than they asked for. Finally, Jesus is going to use a common Roman practice to demonstrate God's idea of justice. Judea at this time was under military occupation, as we know, by the Romans, the Roman Empire. And, and there was a rule that all Jews could be forced to carry a Roman soldier's equipment, their, his gear, if he requested it. Now, they would only have to do this for a mile. That was what the, the, the rule said. And so Jesus' reply to this request is, you know what, go the extra mile. Go two miles. They say, you have to carry my gear for one, go two with them. Turn an act of tyranny into an act of love. I love that. A greater act of love. You know, it disarms them. It disarms, it disarms the power of tyranny when you, you do something even greater in love. Now, what Jesus has just said here, to, to walk two miles carrying Roman's gear, this is a direct affront to what the Jewish nationalists or the zealots what they would have oh my gosh this would have offended them to their core they they wanted rome out badly um, and they wanted rome punished greatly for the audacity for ruling over god's chosen people in their promised land the the audacity to to take or or to um conquer what god has given to his chosen people it it was the source of a great deal of, of struggle. I told you earlier, it's ultimately what brought down the Second Temple and Jerusalem in 70 AD was the act of the Zealots. And if you're familiar with the disciples who follow Jesus, the ones who, who were mentioned most often, um, there's one in particular whose name is Simon. This is not Simon Peter. This is Simon the Zealot. And when I read this teaching, I, my mind immediately went to Simon the Zealot and I thought, oh my gosh, how did he respond to this? Right? He's, he's probably sitting up on the mountain gazing at Jesus, like transfixed by this amazing teaching. And you just know that Jesus had this ridiculous charisma and presence about him. And, and all of a sudden Jesus says something that just turns his, his whole belief system upside down. Uh, excuse me, you said what about the Romans? carry their gear for two miles is this before or after I kill them right I, I just have tremendous sympathy for for Simon and how he would have received this particular part of the teaching and sometimes it's fun to to think about how those who were close to Jesus may have received what he was teaching because we're we're kind of far removed from it because we've had literally millennium to millennia to uh, be taught this and to get it into our spirit and we have had Holy Spirit they didn't have Holy Spirit in them when Jesus is giving this teaching that doesn't come until Jesus sends them out so we have Simon the Zealot who's probably fuming a little bit at this point um, or maybe he's being introspective and thoughtful and saying yeah if Jesus is saying this my whole way of thinking was wrong or somewhere in between that um, but now Jesus is going to drive that very point home. So you can imagine Simon the Zealot sort of ruminating on what Jesus has just said. And now Jesus is going to go in and just rock his world completely. We're going to look now at verses 43 through 48. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Aren't, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus has just taught to love, no, Jesus has just taught 
to serve your enemies. That's the last thing he said. And now he's saying for us to love our enemies. That's audacious in a good way, but it, it's audacious. And you know why it's audacious in a good way? Because that's exactly what Jesus did for you and for me. You want to know where? Let's go to Romans 5.10, where that point, very point is driven home. And Paul says, For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We were God's enemies, and while we were still God's enemies, while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. With that perspective, it might be a little easier to stomach and process and, and apply that truth in your own life. Jesus is giving us the heart towards God, his heart, so that we will be able to do what seems impossible for us to do. This is the very promise that, that God gives us through Ezekiel 36 verses 26 and 27. Let's go there and it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart, from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Jesus is laying the groundwork for this very promise. He's showing us what this is going to look like. I mean, when this was spoken, they had no idea what this was going to mean. And now we can see Jesus's teaching in light of how all this is going to happen. Jesus is teaching us how to apply what we're going to, to act and want to do when Holy Spirit indwells within us. This is the point. When Jesus tells us to pray for those who persecute us, He's telling us to bless them in prayer. You know, you can go into to Psalms, you can go into Jeremiah. There's there's a number of places where where the people are praying for their enemies. That's not necessarily what Jesus is telling us to do because uh, some of those prayers can be pretty harsh. I mean, David talked about prayers for his enemy. He he prayed for his enemies in ways that uh, that they may suffer, that they may know uh, justice. This is not what Jesus is talking about here. He is talking about blessing those who persecute you, which may sound like a beatitude that we just read last week. Jesus is telling us here to move our heart posture from non-retaliation, don't do it, to love. This is in direct opposition to what the pagans believed. And Jesus is setting us apart. And, and it, it starts with our hearts from our hearts, right? It, from our hearts, actions and words follow. It's, it's rarely the other way around. Um, I can tell you one quick little story that uh, a, a mentor, uh, she's, she's now with Jesus in heaven. Um, there were some people who I was kind of envious of and, and she would tell me, she'd say, um, I want you to bless them. And I, I'd say back to her, you know, they seem pretty blessed to me. I don't want to bless them. And she'd say, go ahead and bless them anyway. And, and over time, as I, it started off pretty, well, not very Jesus-like. And I'd say, fine, I bless them. God bless them with this or something to that extent. But by the time I came back around to her, I was blessing them and I meant it. That transformation had taken place in my heart and I was already a believer. And so what Jesus is telling us is, is that the, the, the way that it usually works is that you begin with the heart posture and your words and your actions will follow and meet that. And he reemphasizes this. Um, I think I told you last time that, that Luke also captures some of the Sermon on the Mount. This is a bit of a different take on another part of the sermon in Luke 6, 45, which says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So we see that, that the heart directs actions and words in this. I think Jesus is, is telling us that when we love our enemies, uh, well, he does say when, when we love our enemies that we're children of God. 
Um, when I hear that, I immediately am reminded of the beatitude of peacemaking, right? That those who are peacemakers, they're children of God. So what we're doing when we love our enemies is we're making peace with them. And all of this, if, if all of this is impossible to consider, at least without God's grace, consider Jesus's final thought in the chapter. Therefore, be perfect like God. What does he mean by this? Because I'm not perfect. I'm just Michelle. I, I do things, some things better than others. I don't do any of it perfectly. I rarely come close. <laughs> but what Jesus is talking about in this case is that, first of all, that we live within, uh, well, we live according to the blessings of the kingdom. Um, we're not going to hate people. We're not going to disparage them to others. We're not going to slander them or speak gossip about them. Um, we're not going to covet what's ours or what's not ours or allow ourselves to lust over someone by God's design. We're not going to make false oaths. We're not going to lie. We're not going to make false claims. We're going to look to God to defend us from our from slights and insults rather than try and enact that justice ourselves. And we love everyone, including, and I would say especially, the ones who persecute us. Now, the word that Jesus uses for perfect, it means complete, or uh, also in the Aramaic, it means whole. Um, to me, what it means in this instance is that we wholly or completely align ourselves uh, with God. Um, so not only are we not going to do the physical sin of murder, but we're also going to align our hearts, our souls to God, so that we're not even going to anger in our hearts. We're not even going to want to. I think that's what he means by being perfect, like our Father is perfect. We're, we're wholly going to, to commit to the intent and practice of the law, not just in the physical actions of it, but also in our heart posture towards it. That's what I think what he means by being perfect. And that ends our time today. That ends our chapter today. We're through chapter five. We're through the first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. The next time we meet, we're still going to be in the Sermon on the Mount. This time, Jesus is going to introduce the three duties of faith and, and what it means to honor God by performing each one of those. So that's where we'll be next time. And as I mentioned last time and I'll probably want to keep encouraging you for a while on this go ahead make comments uh, make um, if you have any questions if you have any critiques if there's something that you disagree with <laughs> uh, someone that I follow says put it in the chat so put it in the chat and and if you don't want to do it that way then reach out to us directly at connect at equippedkingdom.org we want to make this a community. I think this is the first step towards doing so. The people, I know some of you who are watching this and I know you have something of value to add because you yourselves have taught me things. So let's let's make this something that, that adds value all the way around. Um, I really believe fully in this and so I just want to encourage you to step into it. But until next time, uh, I just want you to know that I love you. I'm praying for you that, that every day you go deeper into God's heart to know more about who he is, especially where, where he is for you intimately and personally, because it's extraordinary and it's, it's fulfilling and I, I want that for you. Um, and so I, I just pray that that happens for you. I'm praying for you even outside of this time that that does happen for you and that you see the value in that. And so until next time, uh, when we come back again at the Sermon on the Mount, know that uh, I'm praying for you and that I want you to be blessed. So take care and see you next time on Equipped Kingdom.